Thank you, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship with the Presbyterian Church of Western Springs. We're so glad to have you here with us in person, and those of, uh, those of you online, welcome. We're glad to have you here as well. If you are online, I encourage you to have a copy of the bulletin with you. It's available at uh, presbyws.org slash worship. Um, a few things about worship today. We're continuing to wear our masks in worship, and I know that we're seeing things easing up, and the state is making some changes. The CDC has come out with new guidelines, and the session is keeping a close eye on these things, and decisions are going to be made, I, I think, pretty soon as we begin to ease back into kind of the new and next steps for, uh, for our life together at church along with the world. And I think it also... I'll be honest, it gives us a chance to kind of see what's going to happen out there in the world when these, uh, these changes are made. And I know with the schools, uh, there's some easing up going on, and that's going to give us a chance to see. But uh, probably a couple more weeks of what we're doing now and kind of keeping with our, our current plan, and then you'll hear more from the session in the coming, uh, in the coming weeks. So thank you for your continued um, support of your leadership that has really been working at this for two years now. They've been, you know, at the beginning it was meeting every week when they were making decisions and then kind of easing in and saying, we're going to make the difficult decisions, but we're going to make them in a way that is thoughtful and measured and not rushing to do things. And so uh, I appreciate that and I appreciate their willingness to, uh, to approach it in that way. So uh, stay tuned, as they say. I want to say another thank you to Loretta who preached last week while I was away and, and Marcia who led worship with her and uh, express my gratitude to all of you for your support while I was um, away in California while my mother had surgery and she's doing well. I've, I've uh, shared that in the weekly and she's continued to progress. So thank you all for your support of us and of her during, uh, during that time. A couple of other notes. Lent is starting. It's always hard to believe, but last year, actually, Lent started even two weeks earlier. So, uh, so this is two weeks later than last year. Ash Wednesday will be this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. We'll have a service here. Uh, you can either come in person or participate online. Obviously, if you come in person, there'll be ashes in person. If you're online, you have to get creative. Um, but, uh, but 7 p.m. here. I also wanted to share with you a book, A Time to Grow, Lenten Lessons from the Garden to the Table. And this is a book, there are copies of it available in the elevator area outside the narthex for $10. You can grab one if you wanted to um, have a little Lenten journey with others. I'm going to be reading it. I'm going to be bringing parts of it into worship as well. And so it's one of those times where you could read it, do daily devotional practices that are in it, they're very short, which I like. Uh, they're easy to do, um, and so a good option. There are others, and if you're looking for something in particular during this Lenten season, come talk to me. Uh, I'm happy to talk with you about some other options that, uh, that I've seen out there, but I'm looking forward to this one. I'll be very honest. Part of why I like this is that she focuses on growth and the green and the new things, and one of the, the things I've always liked about our Lenten time is that it coincides with spring and newness and new life, and I think we're all ready for that in our lives. It's ironic to me that during Lent, a time of kind of paring back and a time of, uh, of walking toward the death of Christ, that I begin to get focused on new life but I think we need it. I think we're ready for it in the life of our church. We're ready for, for some uh, newness, some return to the, um, to the vibrancy that I think we're all longing for. And again, interestingly, I think Lent can be a time for that. Part of preparing for a garden to grow is tilling the soil and, and nurturing the soil and getting, um, and actually, what else do we do with the soil? We fertilize it. And where does fertilizer come from? It comes from the difficult, from the yuck of our lives. So I'm looking forward to Lent with you all and uh, the next few weeks as we move ourselves toward Easter and focus on new growth and new life. I think those are the announcements of the day. A couple of notes about worship today. Our first hymn, we're going to sing the first four verses, not all six, and then uh, also our scripture lesson I've adjusted a little bit. Condi will just be reading that first part that's listed in the bulletin, um, and I think with that, we're ready to worship God together. Condi? Good morning. 
Please stand if you're able and join me in the responsive opening sentences printed in the bulletin. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God and King. Glorious and powerful is the God of all creation. In reverent awe, we gather to worship our God. The Lord our God is King and the just and the just judge of all things for all eternity, all people and all places. In reverent awe, we gather to praise our God. The Lord our God is King and the forgiving God. Fairness and justice are the names of our God. In reverent awe, we gather to worship God within the light of God's holiness, justice, mercy, and love. Amen. Remain standing and we'll sing the opening hymn, just verses one through four. Friends, as we gather in worship, as we gather together in worship, we also are coming individually. We're coming individually before our God who invites us into God's presence, invites us and welcomes us, welcomes all of who we are. And so we come bringing our parts of our, our, parts of our life that we may not feel more naturally come before God, those things that we might think would even separate us from God or keep us from God, and yet God invites us in. God invites us into God's presence, and God loves all of who we are. And so we confess those things, those, those sins, those things that would separate us from God. We confess them before God first in silence, but then join our hearts and our voices in the words printed in the bulletin. Let us go to God in prayer.
continuing in prayer. Forgive us our selfish concerns with earthly things and our failure to acknowledge your glory in the face of Jesus Christ for that blindness to the wonder of your presence that causes us to live our lives from day to day without knowing you. Have mercy on us. Give us grace to discern the suffering servant Lord in the midst of our lives, to worship and serve you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, in the waters of baptism, we are all cleansed, cleansed of our sin and given new life again and again and anew. We celebrate together this day the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who welcomes us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Alleluia. Amen. Having acknowledged the way that we are reconciled to God, let us also reconcile ourselves to one another, offering the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ to those who are worshiping around us. And if you're worshiping online with us, I invite you to use the chat to offer a word of peace to others. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. Well, hello. How are we doing? Good. I have a question about this last month, the month of February. It's almost over. When does it end? I think tomorrow. Is that right? Yeah, tomorrow. Wow, it's almost gone already. I wonder if in school at all you talked about Black History Month. Did anybody talk about it? Were there probably some maybe bulletin boards at school maybe or handouts about it? And I realized today, I thought, oh my goodness, February is almost gone. I think we should talk about it a little bit. And so I was thinking about it because the church is a place where we have a chance to celebrate the way that, uh, that we have been blessed and helped and loved by black people in the church too. The African-American tradition has been a big part of our church tradition. And a lot of the songs that we sing are songs that we have learned from, uh, from the black churches that were a big part of this country's 
freedom from, moved toward freedom from slavery. And the church was a place where a lot of folks found the, um, the inspiration and the motivation to be a part of change. But interestingly enough, the church was also a place that got in the way of those good changes. So the end of, uh, when, when slavery was coming to an end, the church was a place that was kind of resistant. That meant they, they were not helpful. And so what happened was that over time, the church has had to say, you know what, that's not a good thing that we were in the way of that. And I was thinking about it when we were praying our prayer of confession. And when we confess, what we do is we say, basically, I'm sorry. What's interesting when we pray that prayer together and you hear everybody talking, right? Everybody's talking, they're all reading this prayer, and you might be thinking, I don't know why we're praying this. I don't know why we're saying words that may not even be words that are about anything that I did, and yet we're, we're apologizing for things other people did. And that's one of the things the church had to do when it looked at how has the church as a whole been a place that wasn't very good to other people, and especially the church wasn't very good to black people, and this was especially in the southern part of the country. And so the church had to go through this, this process of saying, we acknowledge we did something wrong. And then the second half of that is, and we want to be different about, we want to do things differently, we want to change. And so for a long time now, the last hundred years or so, the church has been looking for ways that it can change and it can seek to be a more loving and a more welcoming place. And so that's one of the reasons why we talk a lot in our church about how can we be welcoming to people? How can we be a place where everyone can feel comfortable coming to church and being a part of our community? And the next step of that is looking at it and saying, I want others to be a part of that too. I want to, I want to have all the pews filled with people. Well, the only way that happens is when we're not just welcoming, meaning nice to people when they come, but when we also say, you know what, maybe my friend would want to come here. Maybe this is a place that I'd want to share God's love with other people. And so I think that that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, is what does it look like when we say to other people, you might like this experience too, and you might find this a place that is trying to be loving in the world. And so I know it's kind of a, a long stretch back to, uh, to what I was talking about with Black History Month, but I think one of the things that we can take away from all of the things that uh, African Americans had to do in our country in order to not just get freedom, but also to, um, to be fully included into the life of, uh, of the country, we as a church can also be about looking for who are other people that have been kind of separated out. Maybe the, the people we don't play with on the playground or the people that we wouldn't necessarily think to, uh, to be kind and loving to. How can we do that more? because that's what Jesus did. Jesus was kind and loving to all people, but especially to those people who were kind of separated out. And so let's try and be those people, people who follow Jesus, who love people, and who try to bring people back together, and also try to take and help people who might be hurting. All right, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for helping us understand how to love other people and to tear down walls that separate us. Help us to continue to be that love in the world. And let's pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can head off to Sunday school.
Our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke. We'll only be reading from chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. If you'd like to follow along, you can quickly find the text in your pew Bible on page 65. Let's listen for the word of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which, was, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sometimes I just want to say amen and then sit down and have that be our sermon of the day, right? That was beautiful. Friends, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we do indeed give you thanks for the gift of music and for the gift of those who bring it to us. We ask your blessing upon this time as we reflect on your word for us and on our lives. Amen. Recently, while sitting around a table with some friends at the end of a meal, unprompted and not really in response to anything anyone else at the table was saying, a friend of mine, looking down at the empty tablecloth in front of him, slightly nervously touching the fabric napkin, simply said, I've never been comfortable with prayer. He continued, with praying aloud, especially, he said, and and especially with with other people. There, There was almost a sense of relief as he kind of exhaled it, but also a waiting to see what was going to happen. Was someone... Was I going to judge him or say something? And, and our other companion at the table, he said, oh, same thing with me. Same with me. And he looked over at me and he says, that's why we've got him here. You must always get asked to pray, he said. You're in the business. And I laughed a little bit and I responded, I do. You're right, I do. But usually when I'm asked to pray, I'll defer to someone else, someone else at the table. Or if I'm asked before a meal to pray, I'll sometimes walk around and look for someone else to ask. So I'll, I'll take responsibility for the prayer, but I may not be the one to do it. So I, I said, yeah, I do. But then I usually defer to someone else. I invite someone else to pray. And, and he looked at me a little bit surprised. He didn't say it. But I knew he was thinking, but that's your job. But he didn't say it. He just looked at me, a little puzzled. After a bit of awkward silence, I said, that's not my job. And we continued to talk a little bit more about how I see the role of a pastor as being one to shepherd, to guide, to equip others to do these, these things. And, and I talked a little bit also about how I know this differs from many other traditions. There are many traditions where the actions of the clergy, the prayers of the clergy, are treated differently or, or deferred to a little bit more in terms of things like prayer or preaching and teaching. Like there's, there's something more in the prayers of the pastor. And so I I looked back at that first man, the one who said he wasn't comfortable praying, and I told him a few stories of other people I've known who've struggled with this. I I recognized that this is a common thing, and then I also shared my own experiences of feeling apprehensive about praying in various settings. We talked a little bit about the ways that I've encouraged others to find ways to pray, to learn how to pray. Talked about Uh, when I worked with our PCWS leaders a couple years ago and and taught some ways to pray so that that they could be leading others in prayer. I shared about our midday prayer sessions during the first year especially of the pandemic where folks learned a variety of methods and approach to prayer in ways that could be both very personal and individual but also communal. We talked a lot about developing a prayer life and that it takes work, it takes effort. And I think for the past three and a half years, if there's there's been something I've continually talked about or consistently talked about, it's it's trying to invite us to be people of prayer. We've done it through adult education sessions on using psalms as prayer devices. We've had workshops on preparing written prayers. We, we had our Stephen ministers who have been offering to pray with others on a weekly basis and to meet with others before church to pray. And again, with church leaders, I've used prayer tools and ways to teach. So I haven't hid the ball here, folks. I have not hidden from you my strong conviction that prayer is an essential part of an enriched experience of God. For many of you, I know prayer is already and has been 
a huge part of your life, for some of you since childhood. Or perhaps a moment or a period in your life where you were compelled to simply get on your knees and go before God in the midst maybe of some time of struggle or difficulty. Many of you have earnestly prayed for people and concerns on our prayer list and for other concerns in the world and in the lives of people you know. Often we pray when we simply don't know what else to do. In, in some instances, prayer or, or the idea of prayer can be a filler almost, a substitute for wanting to be really, really clear that we care. Do you know what I mean? We'll say, I'll be praying for you. When really what we're saying is, I really care a lot about you. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing at all, because loving people and caring for people is important. And in that context, even just the invocation of the word prayer can be something of an encourager or a way of communicating encouragement to others. But prayer is something more than this. Prayer is something more than an expression of love between people. It's something more even than the often typical expression of a desire, a desired outcome to, un, uh, to an unseen divine being. What I mean by that is, is prayer is more than just asking for what we want. At some point, prayer, the focus of prayer, especially in our modern church realm, became almost exclusively about asking God to do things that we desire. And a little bit less, a little bit less about being tuned in or attuned to God's presence. God's presence even when we don't get what we want. Or maybe even especially, especially when we don't. And, and God's presence when we can't seem to feel God's presence. Or we might desire more of God's presence to be known to us and to others. Prayer, at its foundational level, is recognizing that we are in the divine presence. It's listening for God, looking for God, experiencing God. Professor Andrew Root has written extensively about, about prayer in the life of the Christian, and specifically the role that pastors play in both living lives of prayer and inviting others to do the same. In introducing his observation about prayer, Root summarizes the scientific research of psychologist Daniel Simons, who's at the University of Illinois in the area of visual cognition. And I wonder if you've heard of him at all. You may recognize this study. He's best known for a famous experiment in the area of what he calls attention blindness. You can find a video about this experiment on YouTube, and it's popular, popularly called the Invisible Gorilla. This is Root's summary of, of the research. The idea behind the experiment is simple. People tend to think, especially or particularly in this secular age, that seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. We've, we've heard that phrase. We've maybe even said it. For instance, in this example, you'd assume that if you were watching people walking in a circle, passing a basketball, you'd think that you would notice if some person in a gorilla suit randomly walked through the scene, right? Waving his arms up and down and jumping. That wouldn't be possible to miss. Yet half the participants in Simon's experiment, experiment miss it. People assume at rates of over 90% that they are not the kind of people to miss such an obvious, right-in-front-of-your-face event, and yet 50% do. The experiment shows that if people are looking for a gorilla, they see a gorilla. But if your attention is elsewhere, for instance, on counting the number of times the basketball is passed, at least half will miss the interloping gorilla. And that's just how Simon's experiment is set up. Two groups of people, some in white shirts, some in black, pass a basketball between them as they move. The observer is asked to count how many times the people in the white shirts touch the ball. Seconds into the sequence, the gorilla comes walking through. 
Afterward, half the observers are shocked when, they, when they're asked if they saw a gorilla. Now, I did this for myself once, and uh, I didn't see the gorilla. And I was shocked, and I watched it again, and there was this gorilla. Most of the people, like me, assume that there was no such thing, and that those who saw a gorilla are either liars or crazy. Simon's point is clear. Perceptions of reality are contingent on our mode of attention. Let me say that again. Perceptions of reality are contingent on our mode of attention. We are prepared to focus, what we are prepared to focus on, what we are prepared to focus on determines what we see. Root goes on to say that deep-seated assumptions about how to conceive and represent the world what uh, philosopher Charles Taylor calls social imaginaries, inform and frame what we give our attention to. We can and do miss hugely obvious realities when our attention is on something else. In his book, A Secular Age, Taylor argues that in the modern era, our attention has been drawn away from what our ancestors thought was obvious, that a personal God acts and moves in the world. Some would say this movement presents liberation. We've put aside an untenable belief. But Taylor suggests that we've acquired a unique observation blindness. It's not that we've given up an untenable belief, but that new imaginaries have drawn our attention away from divine action and towards something else. New forms of attention make us unable to see what was once obvious. Essentially, we've become distracted. Our lives are filled with things that make it difficult to see and recognize God all around us. In part because we're so focused on these other things, the worries of the day, the anxieties of war or illness or financial insecurity, we're we're so focused on the details of our jobs and our household and our family or even the details of seemingly mundane things, whatever they are, good and valuable things, important things, whatever they might be, they've given us this observational blindness where we're less tuned to see God's movement in the world around us, in our lives, God's movement in our lives and in our stories. When we pray, whether it is on our own or with others, we bring our stories before God. And and we seek to have and to see God revealed in those stories. Those stories of our lives, stories of our struggle, stories of our doubt, stories of our honest searching, stories of our identity. And when we pray, even when we can't see God in those stories, we tell them, we tell our stories, because they might be stories in which others prayerfully see God, and maybe where we even might be shown God in our stories through the words and prayers of others. It's easy to lose track of one particular detail in our reading this morning from Luke's Gospel that Condi read for us a few moments ago. It's a detail that is only in Luke's Gospel. It doesn't appear in Mark or Matthew's Gospels telling of this fantastic transfiguration of Jesus on the mountaintop. And it's a detail that's easy to lose because of that fantastic imagery. Our reading started with this sentence in verse 28. Luke writes, Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and went up on the mountain to pray. They went to pray. They went away, they got away from all that they were doing, their busyness, they went up a mountain, a place set apart, and they went to pray. And while they're praying, in their time of praying, 
in their prayer and in their act of praying, they experience this wondrous sight, this wondrous sight of the appearance of Jesus changing to dazzling white and the appearance with him of Moses and Elijah and hearing the words of God. And friends, it is easy for us to get lost in this text. It's easy to get lost in this text, and getting lost in it is not a bad thing because there is so much happening. There's a lifetime of lessons in it, and there are more directions to take this text in than there are Transfiguration Sundays for the rest of my life. So I'm going to leave you a little bit unsatisfied if you're looking for me to explain everything there is to explain about all the imagery that's in this text. It's certainly not going to happen this morning, but if you do have questions from it, as always, I'd love to hear them and discuss this passage with you. There's a lot in it. But no matter how you analyze all of that imagery, and the scene that unfolds, and, and the new understanding that these disciples receive about Jesus and about God, no matter, no matter how you analyze it, what we see is that it's a turning point in all of the Gospels. It's a turning point in Luke's Gospel where God makes it clear to those disciples that Jesus is God's beloved child, that the disciples are to follow Jesus and that Jesus is intimately connected to God's presence in the world throughout time, especially in the, the lives of, of both Moses and Elijah. This happens when they go on the mountain to pray. This happens when they pray with Jesus. They're able to see, see things they couldn't see, they went up on the mountain to pray. They went up on the mountain to pray, and in their prayer, they experienced the revealing, the, the unveiling, the, the pulling back of the confusion. They experienced the unavoidably present presence of God. And even though the, the disciples are exhausted on this mountaintop, perhaps from the walk, perhaps seemingly from being in a nonstop ministry of Jesus, moment after moment, whatever causes it, we don't know. Luke writes, though, that they were weighed down with sleep. They were weighed down with sleep, but they stay awake. They stay awake because being in God's presence, being in God's presence in prayer in this moment they are shook. They are shook. They are kept awake. They are awake. They are present. They are able to hear and to see what is happening around them. They go up to the mountain to pray, and in their prayer, they experience and they see God. Friends, this is why we pray. This is why the invitation to prayer is so important, because for us it is the same. As we seek to learn to pray, we are seeking God. We are shedding the distractions of the world, good distractions, and the not as good distractions. We are shedding them, and we are being more tuned to God's presence and to God's mingling with humanity mingling with us. When we pray, we are sitting with our grief, our joy, our concern, our worry, our questions, our wonderings, our doubts. We're sitting with all of who we are, and we're looking, we're watching, we're waiting, we're hoping for God's presence to be within those stories and to, and to reveal God's presence within our stories. We do this when we're on our own. I originally said we do this when we're alone, but I don't think we're ever alone when we pray. But we do pray when we're on our own. when we're not with other people around us. And to do that, we might need to change our surroundings. We don't always need to go up on a mountain, although I can tell you that sometimes I do need to do that, and I think mountains can be places where that distance, like the Celtic spiritual tradition says, where the distance between heaven and earth becomes a little bit more thin. You may know 
the thin places in the world where it can be easier to pray, but sometimes we need to make our own spaces easier to pray, to go to a different part of the house, maybe a chair we don't sit in very often, that one that the guests sit in, or a room that doesn't get used, or maybe we need to light a candle, change our lighting, play some music. We need to do something, go outside maybe, take a walk. You see, when we're praying alone or on our own, we sometimes need to find ways to make that easier, to remove the distractions. But I'm also pretty convinced that like those disciples walking up the mountain with Jesus, we need to find ways to pray with one another. As uncomfortable as it can be to share our concerns, to tell our stories, to bring ourselves to one another to be prayed with and prayed for and to pray for others and to watch and to wait for God's presence in the midst of all this all of our lives, all of our stories. Friends, we long for God. We seek God. But without prayer, we're going to miss the gorilla walking through the room. For God is all around us. God is all around us. Even when we think we're the furthest from God, God is all around us waiting to be seen and experienced by us. As a pastor, yes, my job is to be one who prays. But it's also to be one who invites us all, all of you, to be ones who pray. Pray with one another, pray for one another. Jesus is the one who teaches us to pray, taught us to pray, taught us to talk to God as our Father intimately. Jesus invited us into an intimate prayer relationship with God to bring our lives before God. And again, we do this in our individual lives, but also with one another, because that's what the journey is all about, seeking God, being open to seeing God in our lives being tuned to see God in our lives over and over again, actively looking for God with one another in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
seated. After the transfiguration, the disciples and Jesus go down the mountain. This is one of the most important parts of the gospel message. It may not seem like it at first, but there's a little part inside this text where the disciples say, let's stay here on the mountain, right? Let's stay here. They want to build little huts. And I love that imagery because that's how I think I would have been. I would have been like, this is great. This thin space is awesome. Let's stay here forever. But we know that's not what happens. And I've been thinking a lot about this next part of the gospel text, the last part, the part that Condi didn't read earlier. I've been thinking a lot about it this week. Because we watch something happen in Europe that is painful to watch. We, we're watching it unfold every day on the news. I was absorbed in reading accounts yesterday of the invasion of Ukraine and the way that people's lives are being destroyed right in front of us. But the message of our gospel is that Jesus is there in the midst of it. Because Jesus comes down off that mountain and goes straight into a place of despair. A man is there among the crowd and he's shouting at Jesus, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. And this child is, is filled with, with the distraughtness of convulsions caused by a seizure disorder. It's a place of despair. And that's where Jesus goes when he comes down from the mountain. And that's where Jesus is right now, in places of despair, in your places of despair, and in places in the world where there is despair. And the disciples follow him down that mountain, and they go with him down that mountain. And friends, we are to go with him down that mountain. We are to go with and to be with Jesus among those who are suffering, those who are struggling, those whose tanks are empty. And yes, we do that in prayer, but we also do that in walking alongside those who are around us. And we do it by not turning a blind eye to what's happening across the world. Jesus walked down the mountain. Jesus goes to the place of despair. And Jesus goes to the ultimate place of despair when he goes to the cross. When God chooses death as a way to give new life. And so there are no easy answers when we face a world that is filled with despair. There are no easy answers. But there is a God who is there among the despair. Friends, let us go to that God in prayer this day. Gracious God, help us to know your presence. Help us to see your presence in the world around us. Help us, help us to pay attention to you. In our struggles, in our losses, in our pain, and also in our joy, in the goodness of our lives, may we see you smiling with us. God, this day my heart is troubled, along with the hearts of so many, as we watch the despair in Ukraine. Already weary hearts, already weary people who have watched so much loss in our own lives, in our own communities, in our own world with this pandemic, already weary 
we are watching a place and lives be torn apart. Make your presence known to us. Help us to see you and to spread your love to those in, with whom we have contact, with whom we interact. But God, I also boldly pray this day, as much as I struggle to do so, I boldly pray that there would be not just peace, but an end, an end to all war. But especially, Almighty God, an end to this war, this needless war that is causing so much loss right now. Loss we can't ignore, we shouldn't ignore. God, we lament the human proclivity toward violence. We rebuke it. And we align ourselves with you, for you are a God of love. You are a God who brings more and more peace into our lives. And God, you are a God who even among war brings love and that your love can conquer all things, including death. God, we are a people of resurrection, a people of new life, a people who celebrate your salvation. Even when it's hard to see you in the world around us. God, bring your light. Bring your light into our lives that we might bring your light into the world. We praise you and we thank you. May we follow you down the mountain. Amen. Friends, in our time of prayer or our time of worship today, we receive the offerings of the church and dedicate them again and anew to all that we are able to do to partner with God in the world. And so uh, we dedicate those gifts now. There are ways you can contribute online and also in baskets in the back. And we appreciate the continued support that enables us to focus more as a church on what we can do in the world than on how we will do it. Friends, um, we give thanks to God indeed. Let us stand and sing with joy our closing hymn, Lord, the light of your love is shining.
Stephanie and, I, Stephanie and I chose that hymn weeks ago. I don't think we could have ever understood how much that hymn would be needed in our world today. Sometimes the Holy Spirit works in that way. And friends, we do follow a God who goes into the darkness, who brings light into the darkness. And so friends, let us, let us be bearers of that light. Let us go into the world as ones who seek to see God in the world, who seek to be bearers of God in the world, followers of Jesus. Friends, let us walk down the mountain with Jesus and go into that world. Let us go with the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.